Our guest speaker today is Dr. Hammond, and he is the 2019 Rural Healthcare Professional of the Year. He is our speaker today. And he will be our speaker at the Santa Lac County Senior Citizens Fair. We have flyers up front there by um, Tanya. And he will be speaking on Live Stronger, Live Longer. So, with no further ado. Thank you. Hey, good morning, afternoon. Um, this topic will be about addiction and substance abuse. Let me just put everyone silent. So, this is kind of an introductory kind of lecture to, you know, what addiction is how people become addicted and ways to kind of overcome addiction. It doesn't really delve much into like the exact therapies about, you know, therapies that are out there now, except I do touch on it at the end. Um, and Mackenzie, just to put out there, Mackenzie is looking at different options for our patients, utilizing uh, in-hospital uh, treatment options as well as telehealth related. So a lot of cool things we're looking at in the very near future. So stay tuned for that. So, this is our crisis. Disturbing video, I do apologize, but I do have to show this for effect, okay? Careful, will be. Is your girlfriend? Your, and your, oh my God! Don't, don't. We call the ambulance. Andy. We call the ambulance. Andy. Hey, don't. Hello. Hello. Hey. Uh, Andy. 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 Where's your phone? Andy. Uh, Andy. 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 You call them one already? Yeah, yeah. We we call. Yeah, we call. Oh my God, baby. One lady. Oh is your baby? Uh, no, it's my friend. Are your friend? Yeah, we call the ambulance now in the police. I know her, yeah. Like that? Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, is that only in the video for Is she okay? Yeah. Is she okay? Yeah. Oh my God, I'm, I know her. Yes. I've seen her, I was talking to her. Uh, uh, oh my God. Oh my God. You okay, yeah. baby? You okay? Mommy be okay. You okay, baby? Mommy be okay. Where is she? Right here. Yeah, yes. she's here. Yeah, I know her. Can you watch your daughter? Yeah, I see. I, I don't know. Uh, be, be, be. Yeah, she be okay? Yeah. Well, okay. She'll be okay? Okay. Yeah? yeah? She'll be okay? Yeah. Yeah? She'll be okay? Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna... So that can be any supermarket in America. That's not a, that's not a, a bum on the street corner. That's a, that's a soccer mom. That's a mom. So we're all, so, Urban Michigan, rural Michigan is all fair game. So heroin is no longer a dirty drug, okay? There's a gateway to heroin. Um, people who are addicted to alcohol have a 2%, um, like a 2%, um, a two times higher risk. Marijuana, three times. Cocaine, 15 times. Opioid painkillers, 40 times more likely to be addicted to heroin. 40 times. So now we're seeing an increased rise of opioid overdoses since the year 2000. J drug overdoses as well. I'm gonna, so there's like 70 slides. I'm going to speed through some of these. I know it's a lot. Michigan's been one of the hardest hit states in the country for opioids. Number 10th in the U.S. for opioid prescription rates, 18th in overall deaths due to opioids. Our ER visits, we've seen a lot more ER visits due to substance abuse encounters. <clears throat> now, interesting here is that so we see an increase here of visits. So this age here, we see an increase of ER visits due to substance abuse disorders for an increasing amount in their 60s to 70s. So these patients are prescribed painkillers and sometimes they take more than necessary for pain control or because they're addicted. So again, who we are, where we are, it doesn't matter anymore. We're all fair game for substance abuse disorders. Increased over, <coughs> overdose with death rates. So in 1999, we saw 99 deaths in the state. In 2017, 2,033 deaths. 
more than 20 times increase. Rural Michigan is not immune. All the dark blue states here, so all the dark blue counties here are rural, um, are um, overdose death due to heroin. And over here it's a darker brown. So you see a lot of rural here, rural state, one of the counties affected. That's her mom at the supermarket and her poor girl looking for her mom to wake up. Okay, so basic stuff. What's a drug? A drug is any substance that can, um, other than food, which can cause uh, changes in the body or mind functions. Um, they can have medical purposes or not. They can be plants or made in labs. It can be legal, illegal, helpful, or harmful. Substance use, appropriate use. It's to get better if you're sick, to reduce pain from illness or injury, to prevent illness, to manage mental illness by balancing brain chemistry, to help the body do things it can't do on its own, like make insulin. Then there's psychoactive drugs, drugs that alter the way that you think and feel. So there's caffeine, nicotine, Ritalin, cocaine, Adderall. So some of these are legal, some are illegal. Why do people use drugs? To forget problems, get high, lose weight, go to sleep, they're bored, gain confidence. They're socializing to be cool, hang out with friends, and they just want to sometimes just feel a little different, altered states. Uh, drug use has been seen in uh, film to be symbols of rebellion, sex symbols, sports athletes, for some religious rituals, to have fun, reduce anxiety, experiment, um, reduce pain. And there's substance abuse versus misuse. <coughs> Misuse or abuse can be any use of a drug that causes personal problems such as health, work, relationship, legal, finance, or emotional use. Frequent forms of abuse, taking too many pills. Um, sometimes it's to relieve pain, to help sleep. You know, one pill didn't help me sleep, let me take two or three. Uh, they take them for too long. You know, they had surgery. Surgeons, um, the surgeon thinks you might need some pain medication for three days. Day number 10, I'm still taking it. I don't have as much pain, but I just want to keep taking it. And there's improper use, taking the drug for a different reason. So um, mom was prescribed Tylenol 3 for a toothache. Um, my ankle hurts me today. I'm going to take some of her pills. Uh, frequent forms of abuse, there's improper combination. People combine medications, especially with alcohol. We see a lot of you know, painkillers and alcohol, sedatives plus alcohol, just makes things uh, a lot more dangerous. And you do not have to be an addict to be a person with substance use problems. Majority of people who use substance, majority of substance abusers are not addicts, they, but they do become addicts eventually. Um, there's certain uh, definitions we use to diagnose addiction disorders. Addiction is, an, oh, addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Um, our body, our brain looks at like a reward pathway. We use something one time, it feels good, we want to use it again. So we get that reward by using it. Our brain says, I don't feel good until I use that drug and I feel rewarded for using it too. And then you end up building what they call tolerance. So you use it and it doesn't work as strong anymore, so you have to take more of it. We'll talk about that more, but that's where we become addicted. Uh, just to sum it up, addiction can, um, can result in disability or even premature death. In addition, to, um, like in addition, it can cause problems with relationships, occupations, uh, school. A lot of words here, but just uh, some basic definitions of substance use disorders. The major ones, use, you're using larger amounts over a longer period of time. Um, persistent desire or effort to cut down or control, however, you just don't get to it. Um, you can develop withdrawal and withdrawal symptoms if you don't get the medication or the drug. You can build tolerance to the drug, which means um, over time it doesn't work as strong, you have to use more of it too. Um, it affects your uh, daily activities. You pretty much schedule your work day, pretty much you schedule your day around how can I get my drug. Uh, people will not fly on a plane because they can't take heroin on a plane, so they rent cars and travel that way. It literally affects every aspect of their life. Uh, so when you have two or three symptoms, um, you know, I get the craving, I want it, I get withdrawals. These can help define a substance use disorder. It affects your job performance. You, you're tired if you don't have it. 
More and more of these symptoms add up to like mild substance use disorder, moderate or severe. Um, here is the, this, this I find very interesting. So I wish I had a, a laser here to point, but here, so alcohol and drug consumption, non-use, misuse, abuse, and addiction. So it starts off non-use, I'm using none. Moderate use, it mild, turn into misuse. Substantial use becomes serious, abuse, and then heavy consumption, severe problems, addiction. And it literally flows like that too. Oh. Uh, number of millions of drugs used, so we're seeing a lot more illicit drugs than marijuana. Uh, psychotherapeutics such as your Adderall, your stimulants, cocaine, hallucinogens, inhalants, heroin. Um, this is in 2002. Uh, I'm sorry, this is 2012. Now, we're, actually, we're seeing heroin higher than inhalants, actually almost higher than hallucinogens. And that's because we're trying to cut back on opioids, and people are jumping to heroin. 7% uh, of people who are no longer using opioids go to heroin. If 7 to 10%. It's cheaper. It's more accessible than it was before. Okay, I'm going to skip over this. We talked about this real quickly. The three C's of addiction, control, compulsion, consequences. Control, repeated attempts to cut back or control use, but you lose control of it. Compulsion, you feel that you must use it. You develop cravings, withdrawals, psychological need. Consequences, uh, negative consequences are there, but you keep using it. Three C's of addiction. Other definition, substance abuse is any drug that breaks healthy connections with family, friends, and society. What contributes to the development of substance abuse disorders and addiction? A lot of factors, a lot of them. There's some that say adverse childhood events, trauma as a child, mental health issues as a child, physical health. These children are five times more likely to use, I'm sorry, seven to, ten, seven to 10 times more likely to use uh, illicit drugs um, than others. The age of onset, the earlier the age of onset, so 40% higher rate of addiction if you, if you start at 14 years or younger, 10% if you start over age 20. So the younger you start, the more addicted you'll probably become. Risk factors, personal factors, lack of attachment to healthy adults, mainstream culture, you don't have any good role models, uh, family history, genetic issues, personal characteristics, so those who are prone to anxiety, depression, impulsiveness, mental illness, health issues, uh, sex, gender, males are more prone to becoming addicts. Early drug use, as we talked about. External factors, family of origin. I came from a family of drug users, I probably will use drugs as well. Abuse from family and others, domestic abuse in the household, physical abuse in the household, child abuse, these people are more likely to use drugs than others. Culture, you know, my uh, uncle grew up in a culture of it's okay to smoke weed, it's okay, it's accepted, it's cool to smoke weed. He smoked weed too. And that was a gateway. It's other things too, I'll tell you about later. External stressors, job stress, single parenting, any stressor can cause others to you know, want to use. Exposure to trauma, natural disasters, wars, rape. Availability, you know, I'm in an area where people are selling drugs near me. I'm in an environment where it's, it's okay to use drugs. I'm probably end up using it too. Peer pressure. Risk factors, you have multiple psychiatric, environmental, family, behavioral, social, genetic. Um, loneliness, depression, hopelessness, uh, male, gender, family, use of drugs by parents, siblings, spouse, social, the age of first use, the younger you start, the more likely you are to become addicted. Uh, those with behavioral issues and those who have genetic predispositions to alcohol, drug dependence, Native Americans uh, have a higher rate than anybody else in the country because they're just genetic predisposition to getting intoxicated quicker. They actually lack this, uh, they lack this enzyme that helps regulate alcohol consumption. So a couple of beers and they're d drunk, whereas somebody else could drink the same amount of beer and not become drunk. It's, and their face actually shows it, they look really red. It's, I've seen it before, it's interesting. You kind of know, like, I'm not drunk. Like, yes, you are. <laughs> uh, so drugs do play possible uh, roles, functions, it helps people forget the past, saves off withdrawal, um, withdrawal from intimacy, um, 
people who want to act out of self-hate, instead of cutting themselves, they'll just pop a couple of pills. Addiction to other experiences. Uh, there's a correlation between addiction to drugs with addiction to sex, gambling, pornography, shopping, internet. Shopping, my wife is not addicted to drugs, but she's a shopper. <laughs> Role-playing games, television, my brother. No, I don't go there. Uh, red flags, so those who have been, so if you have a patient or a family member or a friend who you know has been sexually abused as a child, uh, grew up in a household with drugs, um, or s smokes, even tobacco, they're more at risk of developing uh, drug abuse issues than others. The process of dependencies, again, and over, it's a lot of slides, I'm going to zoom through some of the unnecessary ones. So you have your non-users. Uh, those who want to use drugs or those who don't want to use drugs because they don't want to. Uh, religious reasons, they had negative, exp they had negative um, like, um, like experiences. People who have used drugs in front of them, they saw bad side effects they don't want to do either. Some just know that using drugs is not a good thing to do, so they just don't use. Then you have your experimentals, those who actually just want to try it for the first time, you know, just to do it. Uh, usually they just want to try it, friends use it. Um, they feel safe about the drug they're going to be using. Yeah, I could smoke marijuana, it's not that bad. Um, reasons for uh, experimenting, they're bored, they want to feel like they, they, they belong, they're curious, depressed, they want to try something new, different. And you have your uh, concepts here. If they don't enjoy the effects, they go back to non-use. If they do enjoy the effects, they become social users and then Risk factors uh, for experimental use, using too much and are using too strong of a dose. Beginners don't know how to handle what their body can take. Uh, teenagers often start with binge drinking, and then if they're using street drugs, they don't often know the source, dealer, manufacturer. They don't realize that the heroin is cut with uh, another drug, which makes it more uh, deadly, addictive. Then they turn to social use. So you have your non-use, your experimentals, now you have your social use. Uh, key concept here is using does not take priority over other life activities and experiences. So they don't focus their, their day around getting the drug. They just use it, they're out with friends, they'll drink, they're out with friends, they'll try marijuana, they'll do it. They've done it before and, they'll, and they don't mind doing it again. To celebrate, to socialize, you know, it's, it's not a big deal, it doesn't affect them. And so, so they can still not use and be fine, not be addicted, not be craving it. And then instrumental use, those who use it for pleasure seeking, avoiding pain. So, so, so we see a progression, non-use, misuse, experimental use, instrumental use. Now they need it for pleasure seeking, for avoiding pain. Habitual use, here's where it gets heavier. So drinking drug on a regular basis, potentially increasing risk, prob risk for problems in life. Uh, problems may emerge in relationships, work, school, health, finances, legal. It becomes literally, how do I get my day around using my drug? Can I go to work at 10 o'clock in the morning, use at 9? What if I have to sit later at work? What should I do? Should I head in my car? You know, I have to go on a family vacation. Should we fly? It's cheaper to fly, but I can't if I don't want to risk getting caught in the airport with this drug, so I might have to just take a rental car instead. So that means I'm, so I need more days off of work because I'm driving. It just really becomes a domino effect. You know, you really... It's not just, I'm using a drug, I'm addicted. It's like, how can I, you know, revolve my life around these drugs? And it's not just your life, your family's life too, you know? So it's, it's really, it's, it's sad. And then those develop tolerance withdrawals if they don't use. These are the ones who need to use. They're overwhelmed. If they don't use, they get withdrawals. They get sick. They're dependent uh, psychologically and physically. Then you have your binge use, those who just use heavy periods at one time and stop. Um, here's a typical alcoholic. It's a doctor, a house mom, an attorney, a military officer, a student. So there's no such thing as a typical alcoholic. We all look like, we all look like them and they can be alcoholics. So you don't know. Same with drug abusers too. Process of recovery. So you have to. It's a. It's a whole. It's a whole spectrum of you know. You got to want to quit. You have your spiritual, social, 
how do you think, you act, you feel. There's stages of recovery. There's getting clean. Uh, those who are in early recovery want to get clean. They change the way they live. They try to get better sleep, diet, exercise. They avoid those who use, those who pressure. They build support with those who are positive influences. There's middle recovery, stabilization. Those who can turn to family and friends, have strong support groups, develop life skills, stress management, less focus on using. So there's still in that, you know, I want to use, but I really have to develop better habits, hang around better people, and just keep myself occupied. Late recovery maintenance. Okay, so they're, they've not used. How do you stay away from it? How do you not want to go back? This is probably the hardest stage actually is almost maintenance. Certain aspects of recovery include uh, recognition, cessation, education, support, counseling, relapse prevention, dealing with underlying issues. Uh, let me actually go back to this one here. So the, the last one dealing with, dealing with underlying issues is those who have, those who started abusing drugs because they were under work stress, marital stress, um, those are the ones that are the hardest ones to kind of keep clean because they have that tendency to, okay, I'm, I'm getting that trigger again. Me and the wife are having problems again. My boss is on my back again. Back in the day, I used to use. I used to go back and, you know, snort, you know like sort of line of cocaine. That sounds kind of crazy, but this, so I used to abuse and I'd feel better. And then the whole cycle would start over again. So those are the hardest ones to deal with. You have, you have your models will change. So, you can't just jump to like, I need to quit. You have to want to quit. The worst, I, uh, I volunteered in the detox for a while, and this is a detox where people would pay a lot of money to get this really expensive medication under anesthesia to detox from opioids. It was called rapid drug detox, 8,000 bucks. And that was the cheaper part. So this program was the cheapest one in the country. Normally they do it in Hollywood and Miami, and it's twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars. So you have an eight thousand dollar procedure where people would fly into Metro Detroit, go to Livonia, Michigan, not far from where I live, and go to the hotel next, not too far from where I live either. So these people were, you know, congressmen, NASCAR drivers, athletes, attorneys, physicians, officers, uh, who had the money to do this program. And my job there was to actually do the interview. So they would fly into Metro Detroit on a Sunday. Monday, I would meet them, do their history and physical, kind of how did things start, how you become addicted in the first place. And then Tuesday was a procedure. And what it was is um, they, went, uh, they went under anesthesia and got this medication called Vivitrol, which now is a mainstay of therapy. And they would get under anesthesia. And what it would do, it, it would take away four, seven to 14 days of the withdrawal symptoms, the diarrhea, I feel like crap, I'm gonna kill myself, a horrible feeling. So by the time the anesthesia wears off, they may have some diarrhea, some nausea, and, but the addiction part of it is gone. The physiological dependence on it is you know, better. But what we tell them to do is use whatever you're using until right before your procedure. So procedure is Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, use what you're using until like eight o'clock in the morning. So these people are flying in to Metro Detroit with tons of opioids, pills, taking the rental car from, you know, Chicago to Detroit full of heroin, using what they're supposed to be using. So those who were heroin addicts who didn't want to drive their car would fly into Metro Detroit, get a ride to the hotel. Livonia, Michigan is not downtown Detroit. It's not, it's not the ghetto, right? So next to Livonia is a mall called Laurel Place, so Laurel Park Mall. My wife and girls would go there. So I would ask these users, okay, you need your heroin. How are you getting heroin in, in Livonia, Michigan? The shuttle bus takes us from the hotel to the mall. I'm like, yeah, but how do you know, how, how, how do you find it in the mall? Oh, you, you just know who has it. You just know who has it. This was 2011. You just know who has it. I told my wife, you're not going back to that mall. <laughs> I didn't know how bad it was at the time. You know, this 2011, 2010, 2011, it's kind of like, wow, people are into heroin around here, you know? Then come to find out it's in rural Michigan, it's a 
I started here a few months later. I'm like, well, it's up here too. And then it, you know, so anyway, so they would score heroin at the local mall where my family would go to, you know, freak me out. And they're not homeless people. They're not winos. They're not living under a bridge. These are, you know, soccer moms, professionals. So those who came to the procedure would come there because a lot of them would be under, you know, they were told by their employer, look, you're slacking off at work. There's something going on with you. What's wrong with you? They didn't want to say, but I need to quit. So they thought about it and they wanted to quit. Those who were really rich and just get my mom off my back, let me go do this thing just to shut her up, those are the ones who probably had the lowest chances of success with wanting to quit. So those were even in this stage of contemplation. They just did it just to, you know, for, for all the wrong reasons. So those who want to quit, those who truly have things to lose, are the ones who are going to be the best at maintaining, you know, maybe I guess by not relapsing. So those who aren't ready, you know, um, who aren't even thinking about it, like that kid that would fly in, that really rich kid that would brag about his Ferrari and, yeah, I'm doing this, to, my mom's on my back and this is my third time doing it. I did the one in California for $25,000. She won't give me another 25 grand, so I'm doing this one that's cheaper and I get to pocket some change if she doesn't work. I've heard it all. So this guy was hanging out down here. He doesn't want to quit. He doesn't want to quit, doing it for all the wrong reasons. Those who want to quit, they're successful. They really are. Relapses return to previous behaviors. Factors, uh, you know, for relapse, um, urging cravings, the uh, unpleasant desires, they just don't feel well being not using. So they, those do relapse. Uh, interpersonal problems at work, conflict with others. You know, I don't feel good anymore. I don't feel like I'm, I'm I don't feel like I normally did when I was kind of you know, you know, had that buzz, I want to go back to using again. Oh, God. So, having friends who use, and I'll tell you, when I did this procedure, it's really, so if you ever, if you ever get a chance, look up rapiddrugdetox.com. Now I think you sold it to the anesthesiologist, but um, these people would get this procedure at a surgical center, go to this hotel in Livonia. I won't say the name of the hotel, but there's two of them there. So, and then they would have this procedure done, go there and kind of recuperate for like two or three days. And we would do medical rounds of them in the hotel. So they had like this whole floor of people who were recovering from this procedure, who were diarrhea, vomiting, but it would have been a lot worse if they tried quitting cold turkey. And my God, when I would go in there to see how they're doing sometimes, they'd be crying like, what's wrong? Is anything hurt? No, no, my dealer keeps calling me. He's mad that I'm here. My boyfriend keeps calling me, he's mad that I'm here. Because <laughs> they were the ones who were enabling them, who encouraged them to use. It was horrible. I'm like, please turn your phone off. This mom was there, with, and this mom was in the room crying, like, why? Because my son's dealer keeps calling him, but it's his best friend. I'm like, what do you want to do? I just want to break that phone. Talk to him about it. He said, Mom, break my phone. She put the phone in the bathtub full of water. It was the hat pad. Because. <laughs> How can your dealer be calling you mad that you're in a detox? How can you do this to me? I thought we were friends. It, it, that, it sounds silly, but this, no, but this is a mind control they have over these people. And when you're a dealer, the people come to you because they know they're going to come to you. They trust your product. They trust you're going to give them something that's going to work, that's decent. You're not going to cut with anything dangerous. You give me a good price. These kind of relationships exist. And, you know, when they're detoxing, it comes out in full force. I'm like, these guys are really that controlling over people. It's bad. Husbands tell their wives, you know, um, well, if you go do it and you come back, I might do it in front of you. And if, I do, I'm like, I'm like, if that's too much for you, then too bad. You know, so these relationships that were probably not healthy to, healthy to begin with, um, spouses and loved ones would not be encouraging of this, you know. So it's... It's sad, but people are really huge influencers of others. Places, you know, I walk by a drug house on my way to work, and, you know, I used to go in there and grab some weed. I'm walking by there again. How do I avoid that feeling, that urge to go back in there? So, huge. Um, you know, former rituals, you know, uh, people who, uh, you know, would 
drink a beer after work, you know, it's, it's common, it happens, but then a beer turns into smoking, turns into doing other things too. Emotional stress, again, I'd get mad at something I'd go use. Um, I go to a concert, before I go to a concert, I get hammered before I go, just because I had the best fun that way too. People associate different things with using, so breaking this habit is so important, it really is. Blaming others, so addiction is often maintained by the process of blaming others, sometimes yourself, but more others, you know, well, he gets me mad, so I use. My boss is a jerk, so I use. Um, how do you process a relapse? It's important for people who want to quit, it's important to realize what are their triggers, what are their, what would make them relapse. This way they could hopefully avoid triggers. Okay, addressing substance use with others. You have to talk to them about, so what's important to you is, um, this is where you assess how bad they actually want to quit. Are you quitting for all the right reasons? Are you under middle stress? Is this affecting your job, your family? Um, getting them to be very open about that is so important. Those who have had previous uh, recovery, uh, those who were clean for a long time, reminding them, how long were you clean for? Two months, wow, how, what made you go back to using? Was it worth it? You know, and uh, makes them feel a little uncomfortable at times, but it's important that you prod them and you get to them about that, because otherwise, ignoring that aspect, you know, when I get people who smoke, um, have you ever thought about quitting? Oh yeah, I quit before, I, um, I could do it. How long did you quit for? Six months. Six months? Congrats, that's awesome. But what made you go back? Well, I was stressed out, my son gave me a hard time, so I started up again. So that's blaming others and going back to using it. So it's like a domino effect, it really is. So how do you break that? How do you break that habit? You get them to acknowledge what made them use, what made them, how did they feel when they weren't using anymore? Did they feel good about themselves? You know, did you think you could ever quit for three months before? No, how about six months? Oh, never. Did things taste better? Did you smell better? Did you, did you feel that you're, people will tell you, whoever, like who here quit smoking? Like who here smoked and quit smoking for a long time? All right, so when you quit for more than a week, did food taste better? Did your house smell different? <laughs> did you realize your house smelled like an ashtray? Like, oh my God, my car smells horrible. My mom smoked. She quit for, she quit, she went back, but anyway, she quit smoking for a month. She's like, you know, you're right. When I would walk in the house before, like, mom, your house smells like an ashtray, you know? After a month, she's like, you know, you're right. I do, I do smell the curtains. I walked in the house, and what are you doing? She's washing all the curtains. They smell horrible. Oh, now you smell that, you know? Your sense of smell comes back, and you realize how bad you, I mean, it all smells, you know? And honestly, that's the way to do it. With kids who smoke, you tell them, you know, smoke makes your teeth yellow. They don't care about cancer. They don't care about getting cancer. Not, kids are invincible. They care about being cool and looking right. So when you tell them, you know, smoking's gonna t smoking will turn your teeth yellow. You, like use a methyl, give you cavities, make your teeth look nasty, pimples on your face. Um, that, that gets them. That works. You tell adults, your teeth are turning yellow. My teeth are already yellow. Who cares, you know? So <laughs> it's just that dealing with certain people in their age ranges and who they are, I mean, it helps with the discussion quite a bit. Or the way I tell kids that smoke that makes me look crazy, but makes them, makes parents look at me like I'm crazy, but it makes sense. Kids want to be trendsetters. They want to be, you know, the first to do it, the cool one. So in my hospital in Detroit, I would tell like 14 year olds who smoke, you know what would be really cool? You'd be the first one to do it, is if you have your mom start the car and you go to the exhaust and you suck on the muffler. You just inhale what's coming out of the muffler. It'd be so cool. You'd be the first one to do it. People would always wonder why you're doing it. You get the same chemicals as smoking a cigarette. What do you think? You're crazy. Well, so are you. So you, <laughs> the same chemicals that are coming out of that exhaust pipe are going to your body, but not as addictive, right? Look. So rewards. So what makes you want to stay not using, so you feel better physically, not worrying about hurting others. You know, what I was using, I was always worried about my, uh, you know, my dad being disappointed in me, my wife finding out, being mad, my kids finding out I'm using it too. So when you're, when you're clean, you just feel like you're doing the right thing. You know, you feel like you're, you know, you feel healthier, you feel like others are proud of you, you're not giving other people like a hard time. Moms feel better about where their child you know, is because they're not using anymore, they're not worried if they're at a friend's house 
you know, shooting up because they're just, you know, not using it anymore. So this, so, so reminding patients that you're doing well, you're doing well, people are happy, you're doing well, your parents are happy, your spouse is happy too. This helps kind of reward them. So this helps them kind of want to stay, you know, stay in that phase of just moving forward, not relapsing. Roadblocks, identifying what makes you want to go back to using. The stress, I can't quit. I'm a druggie. I've been doing it for years. My parents did it. I'm going to use it too. It's just, you know, it's going to happen. I'm afraid of getting sick. I know when I don't use it for two days, I start throwing <coughs> up. I feel bad. I'm going to have to call to work. I know I'm going to have to do it or I'm going to fail. You know, identifying these roadblocks with patients is so important because we're all human. You know, we're all human. We all feel the urge to want to succeed. So identifying what makes you feel like you're going to fail is going to be huge. Repetition, you know, reinforce with them. You're doing the right thing. And it, and it sounds crazy. This is why, you know, having the right team on board is so important to help people quit smoking, quit drinking, quit using opioids. Because you could give them all the medication in the world, but if, it, but if you don't have somebody who's reinforcing what they're doing with them, why they're doing it, how successful they are, tell them what they need to hear every day, literally every day, then the odds of relapse are a lot higher. This is why... Ideally, you know, when we get our program going here at McKenzie, we're going to have a very aggressive <coughs> program where we're going to have people who are on the path to quitting, and they're going to get phone calls, text messages, emails, how's it going, how are you doing, let's talk. Like, my God, you guys are harassing me, you know, but, but this is what we need. We're, you know, we need to be on them, remind them what they're doing is right, and then they'll get it. After about a week or two of this, they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, th this makes sense, you know, I... I need to be reminded I'm doing the right thing. I need to be reminded that I'm not a loser. Um, so what are the safe limits? So alcohol, we always talk about like no more than two <coughs> drinks a day. Women can drink, uh, you know, more than one drink a day, seven days, or three drink tolerance. Illicit drugs, no safe limit. Tobacco products, not safe at all. Prescription drugs, misuse or abuse, not safe. This next slide, I love this one. <laughs> Not if I only have one one glass of alcohol a day, just one. <laughs> so. That's my neighbor right there. I swear, that's that's how he'd be. So, doctor, I quit. I'm down to one drink a day. Yeah. So, the, the gallon of uh, wine. So, there's different treatment settings. So, you have your medical detoxification, stabilization, inpa inpatient, expensive but effective. You have. Dual diagnosis, so is there a behavioral disorder as well as a substance use disorder? These ones could be hospitalized as well. There's freestanding rehabs or, or even is residential. Um, expensive, but there's actually some insurance coverage for these and actually more and more now more than before too. There's partial, so we have partial hospitalization, temporary recovery, halfway homes. Um, in these halfway homes, let me tell you more about this. There's a lot of halfway homes in St. Clair County that people don't know exist. They don't know it. I was talking to uh, um, a politician who was telling me that his neighbors, he didn't know it, but there was a halfway house down the block where he lived. He had no idea there was a bunch of recovering addicts there. A lot of times you don't, because they're in that stage where they're, they're, they need the support, they need others to tell them what to do, they need to be around others who have been, um, experienced the addiction aspect of it, the withdrawal aspect, and the recovery aspect. So these halfway homes are you know, successful, but, but I'll tell you the problem kicks in when people find out about these halfway homes, where they are. I don't want these druggies in my neighborhood, you know, which is, as a parent, I could see where they're coming from. But then they, that stigma of drug use, abuse, and making, shaming others who are tr trying to quit, it made that uh, politician feel uneasy about his neighbors, you know, and, and their ass, I mean, their view of this halfway home. So he was telling me, you know, Dr. Hammond, we need more of these halfway homes. We need to kind of take away the stigma of those who are trying to recover. Because they're no longer addicts, they're no longer losers, they're winners because they're trying to quit. So yeah, the big part is uh, when they are using, they're abusing, they're addicted, and they try quitting, a lot, so many will experience withdrawals. So. How do you manage withdrawals? Um, in the ED, we try to 
now give opioids if they're addicted to opioids. Now, we, we had a gentleman who came in uh, recently who was on a fentanyl patch and uh, for some reason or other a patch got lost or whatever it was and you know I did the homework and he was actually legitimately using it for all the right reasons and seeing one provider only. I want to help him with his withdrawals and I told him I can't give you an opioid, I can't give you a fentanyl patch because we just can't do that. But we helped him with his symptoms. We, we gave medications to help take away some of the withdrawal symptoms he was having because he was feeling nauseous. He was feeling the creepy crawlies. He was feeling goosebumps. So, feeling, uh, you know, so we gave medications to help take away some of those symptoms for the short term until he can see his provider and get that addressed. So, acute withdrawal symptoms, and I tell patients you might not feel 100%, but you'll feel about 70%. Is that okay? 50%. That's fine. I just don't want to get sick. Um, then how do you manage the craving? Um, that's where you have your maintenance medications. Uh, so you stop using drugs. And how do you uh, continue treatment at the appropriate level of care? So I was a real strong, um, like I was a real heavy user of opioids. And I need more than just, you know, something to help my nausea, my vomiting, my diarrhea. I need some kind of level of maintenance. So they have like methadone clinics. And I'll tell you, methadone clinics, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those before. When I got into this whole like opioid uh, when I was a resident at Henry Ford, I that's when I kind of did that detox program. I'm like, wow, this is, it's a, it's kind of weird. These rich people coming from all over the country for this program. So I'm like, what's locally around here? What are people doing locally who can't afford this? You know, really rapid detox. So I volunteered at a methadone clinic. The doctor I was working with, he's like, yeah, show up at four. Four in the morning, I'm like, four in the morning? He's like, yeah, show up at four o'clock in the morning for your first voluntary shift. So I'm driving 40 miles away at four o'clock in the morning. I might, I had four days off a month as a resident. So I'm one of my days off just to volunteer this clinic. So it's four o'clock, I'm seeing staff set up and at five o'clock the parking lot is full with people wearing suits, people wearing clothes like me and you, people who are going to get ready to go pick up their kids to take them to school. Human beings with problems. So that that so that mom in the park. So that mom who uh, was in the supermarket. I can see that mom. Who, if she didn't have access to methadone. And heroin was cheaper than getting a, a Vicodin or a Norco. It's one third the price of a oxycodone, by the way. It says, okay, I got to feel normal. I need to shoot up heroin. I, I'm, I need to do it to feel normal, to feel like I need to, so I don't get sick. So I can see that mom being at the methadone clinic. So, I, so yeah, so people need these clinics. They need these uh, options for uh, treatment. And we cannot, we cannot hold them, you know, we cannot, we cannot point fingers at them and call them drug users or abusers. And we call them champions, winners, you know, people who actually want to do the right thing. So you have your different ways of therapeutic approaches. Some people like music therapy, uh, yoga, family therapy. You have your behavioral therapies, and these are a lot of them right here too. 12-step programs, eating the right things, nutritional therapy. Then you have your medical therapies. And McKenzie, we're looking at um, being the first health, health system in the thumb to be a to, to, um, to offer a comprehensive approach to medication-addicted uh, therapy. So for alcohol, there's naltrexone, which is also, so naltrexone is this first one. The shot form is called Vivitrol. Um, FDA approved now for opioid withdrawal too. And the price of, so the Vivitrol, naltrexone, back when I was at that rapid drug detox, it was about, their cost is about 400 bucks for an injection. Um, now the cost came down to about 120 bucks. One injection will last you four weeks. It'll take away the craving for, four, um, for about four weeks. There's pills, but if, if you're on the pills and you don't use it for a couple of days, the cravings come back. Um, and if you try using, well, on naltrexone, so what naltrexone does is it blocks your opioid receptors. So your, your cravings, your urge to want to use, goes away. So if you try using heroin, taking opioids on top of that, you probably won't get high, but you might overdose and die. So that's why 
That's why this medication here, you know, which is, it's the great, it's not a Band-Aid, it's actually help people quit. Those who want to quit, it's a beautiful medication. In my opinion, you know, it's a lifesaver. And I've seen it firsthand, it, it works. Um, but going back to that stage of how ready you are to quit, they have to be very ready to quit. Because if they try using on this, they can overdose and die. And you can give, yeah. And it, no, no, antibiotics will make you sick. If you drink on antibiotics, you'll feel sick. So antibiotics here. Um, this one, if you drink on this medication, if you use opiates on top of it, if you use heroin on top of it, you feel nothing. By the time you feel something, you might be so, you might have so much opiates in your system, so much alcohol in your system, you can overdose and die. You can, you can get real sick and, you know, and die. And it's happened. That's why screening these patients, screening those who are appropriately at that stage of, I need to quit for all the right reasons. That's why it's so important. So that's why when we get this program here, we need a very strong mental health component. We need to team up with our mental health partners and really just screen those patients who, who would be good candidates for this. And for those who are not, would be good candidates for, you know, uh, Suboxone, other, um, other medications where, you know, if they do go back to using, they won't kill themselves accidentally. And uh, yeah, so you have your different ways of medication-related ways of quitting. Uh, nicotine, this Shantex. <laughs> have you guys heard that before, Shantex? It works. My mom used it. She liked it. It worked for her. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, so. It makes you have nightmares. Yeah. Or, or vivid dreams, let me tell you. So, my mom had nightmares on it. That was for, well, I can't use it. Makes me, mom, no, use it again. My brother had the best dreams ever. So, like, he doesn't remember. Didn't remember what they were, but he just remembers, damn, that was a good dream. So, in about 30% 30 30 of people who use that Shantex will experience vivid dreams, nightmares. But 30% is a lot. So, and then nicotine gum, patches, lozenges, and this, so, you know, this no longer requires a prescription. So years ago, to have a nicotine patch required a prescription. Nowadays, you can buy it over the counter at Walmart. <laughs> and uh, continuation, how do you get them to stay sober? Support groups, alumni groups, after, prog um, after uh, programs. Uh, virtual therapy with apps, this I like a lot too. It's, you have a lot of apps on your smartphone, you could, any, Download it could be a free download. You could actually get motivational messages every day to your phone. You know, good job on quitting. And you put what day number? You know, I'm four days clean, and they have a special pop up that comes on the seventh day. You've been a week clean. Congratulations. Go by yourself. You know, I mean, it's really these motivational things that we think are, sound silly, but to those who are quitting, you know, it's a huge deal. You know, and then uh, long term goals and long term follow up. You know, like I I couldn't hold a job down for more than a month. Now I've been at this job for a year now, and I'm, I'm getting a promotion. These things, it works. So addiction is a chronic disease. Substance abuse is on the rise. Um, addiction has significant effects on the brain. Treatment is a lifelong process. I don't care if you were abuser or if you were addicted, um, like addicted. If you've been clean for 10 years, you're still a former user. And the odds are a risk factor for for becoming a drug user, a drug abuser, is a previous exposure, previous addiction to it in the past. So even those who have quit are still at risk of relapse. So references and yeah. we own a website. So if you go to the Oxy for ED, that's McKenzie. So. Any questions at all? I know it was kind of quick, but it was 73 slides. I know we had an hour, so you guys got to go back to work. And so I'm sorry. Any questions at all? Comments. I heard the other day that in China they're working on putting a, a chip in people's heads to stop addiction and they're going to start testing it in the United States. I'm all for no, that. Wouldn't that be great? It would be good. And for those that can afford it, it would be good. For those that can go to the And You know, we, we have a lot more ways of, uh, you know, we have proof. I'll tell you the biggest. Chances, chances of success are those that involve, you know, medication therapy in conjunction with behavioral therapy too. And having one, can people quit with behavioral therapy alone? Sure, with medication therapy alone, sure, but you have a better chance of success with combined. 
also with support groups too and and uh, you know it's, it's hard for a lot of people to do this but how do we eliminate the stigma of addiction of abuse of you know not shaming people who use you know I look at people who use as, as having a problem that we could all we're all fair game to just like that picture of all the alcoholics in that picture it, it, it could be any one of us for, it could be your common opioid user your common marijuana user your common uh, drug user of any kind of sort they could all look like me and you they can um, but you know how can we not shame others how can we welcome them for wanting to quit in the first place you know even for me as a parent how can I not be against a halfway house in my neighborhood my daughters will go play outside and how can I get over that it's it's hard it's not easy to do but it's a challenge but we have to internally look within ourselves to to open up to this you know to open up to this to this concept because right now we're seeing you know, record people on opioids on different kinds of drugs um, there's a few slides I took out for time that showed that there's more and more you know, eighth graders using drugs than five years ago you know, mm -hmm. you know it's, it's insane. And I have a daughter who's in fourth grade soon, and she hangs out with sixth graders, who will be eighth graders soon too, and how am I gonna, so it's a lot of things, and, and again, the risk factor for using is friends who use too. So when my daughter's eighth grade friends use, will she be exposed too? So these things are in the back of my mind all the time. So when I'm making these presentations, I'm like, God dang it. How can I get, get that bias off of, you know, how, how can I, so how can I not be afraid of my daughter being exposed to people who are exposed to others who use too. So it affects all of us. I'm a doctor, I'm a father. You know, every profession has it. You know, at that detox I was covering, we had a couple very prominent physicians and surgeons who were there because they had opioid addiction problems as well. <coughs> One to the point where she needed, she had a pick line in for a treatment and was injected into lauded. Well, four times a day. Wow. Not to get high, to stay normal, to not get sick. Wow. Human, you know, raw humans. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it.